Good evening. I'm Molly Mantle, your librarian, and I'm so happy to be joined by Dr. Dambisa Moyo today. Dr. Moyo is a renowned Zambian economist, author, and public speaker. She has authored three best selling books, including the New York Times bestseller, Dead Aid Why Aid is Not Working and How There is a Better Way for Africa. She was named by Time as one of the 100 most influential people in the world and was named as one of Oprah Winfrey's 20 remarkable visionaries. She holds degrees from Harvard University and Oxford University and is a board member of 3M and Chevron. Her upcoming book, How Boards Work and How They Can Work Better in a Chaotic World, draws on her experience to examine how boards must adapt to survive the challenges of coming years. In light of the recent malpractice scandals that have rocked companies like GE and WeWork. Dr. Moyo, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here, um, sort of interacting with you and interacting with Oxford. Let's start with your new book. Um, what's inspired you to write about this topic? Well, two things have really driven me to write this book. Um, first of all, it's really an opportunity to reassert the importance of corporations at a time when there's been a lot of skepticism about what corporations do, particularly in light of the ESG agenda, that's on environment, social, and governance. Um, I think it's incredibly important, not only because the global economy remains precarious post um, COVID, but also because before COVID hit in earnest, we were already worried about a lot of different issues, including inequality, demographic shifts, technology and the risk of a jobless underclass, and of course, climate change. But the second reason I've written this book is that I've been quite surprised that there are a lot of people, particularly business students, but also people who work in business and finance who don't really understand what it is that corporations and particularly corporate boards do. And I felt it was really important because corporate boards, which is essentially 12 people, uh, a team that sits at the helm of these large companies um, are charged with making enormous changes for organizations. And I thought it was important that people understand the mandate of the board, what exactly the board's job is, but also to understand what levers are actually available to influence change. So you talked about the sort of global um, changes in the global economy that have made this so relevant. How do you think that this topic has changed over the course of your career? And why did you decide to write it right now? So corporate boards have been in existence since the 1600s. That's the earliest evidence of corporate boards. And of course, if you think about the enormity of change that has happened to come to the 21st century, everything from World War I and World War II, the Industrial Revolution, technological change, um, geopolitical shifts, and also just thinking about the rise and fall and rise again of China, there have been enormous um, changes in the competitive landscape in which boards have to operate. The reason I'm writing this book now is, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's a lot of skepticism on, uh, on what it is that companies do, what their utility is um, in terms of the, what is this, this is that drives them to make the decisions that they do. And I think that deeply worrying to me is that there's a lost, a lost visibility that companies not only before the ESG agenda, not only provide jobs, pay taxes, are at the tip of the spear in innovation, but also are very, very important in terms of providing infrastructure even before, as I said, ESG, took off in earnest uh, in the last half decade. A lot of our members um, will be uh, aware of uh, the Extinction Rebellion movement and some of them might even be involved. Um, there's been big protests in Oxford. Do you think that the skepticism is justified in any way? Well, it depends on what skepticism. Extinction Rebellion tends, at least to my understanding, to be quite focused on climate change. Hmm. Um, climate change is just one area that uh, is, is critically important in terms of this ESG agenda. The, the ESG agenda has many other aspects. Uh, it contains things such as obesity, um, gun control, voting rights, uh, racial and gender parity, pay equity, uh, the rise of China and data privacy issues. Um, and so it, it, picking on one area, um, do I think there has been an important uh, need to highlight the challenge of climate change, absolutely. But 
it's very important, particularly for students and for people like yourself who are going to be the future leaders to understand that these type of challenges are extremely complicated and very often are accompanied by trade-offs. So just to illustrate, if I may, um, on the one hand, something like climate change is pretty uh, uncontroversial in the sense that we all can look at the data and we see that there's material changes to the warmth of the climate um, and that is because that is man-made. Um, but I think it's also important for people to appreciate that there still are today 1.5 billion people on the planet who've got no access to energy in a cost-effective and sustainable way. And we have to think about not only making sure that those people do not remain in energy poverty, but also make sure that the, the, the ideas that we implement, the policies and the innovations that we deliver to tackle climate change do not inadvertently create second order problems such as disorderly migration just because we were so hasty and we weren't thoughtful about creating long-term sustainable change um, which can continue to drive human progress across the planet. Um, I was a student at Oxford. I did my doctorate there. I know that people talk about the need for greater diversity in the student body. You will not have a greater diversity in the student body um, if people from Africa, South America, and Asia cannot access Zoom calls or cannot actually get a decent enough education as a foundation so that they can attend uh, attend Oxford. And they cannot get that education without energy being a backbone of not only healthcare and education, but also driving outcomes so that they can perform and ultimately be students uh, at the campus such as you are today. Part of what you spoke about, um, by your other reason for writing the book is uh, sort of helping people learn the tools that they can use on boards. How did your own experiences shape this book and what experience did, experiences that you've had did you draw on to write it? So to be absolutely clear, I am what I would call a, an unconventional board member. Traditionally, board members have tended to be um, taken from C-suite. So by that, I mean they would have been a CEO or a CFO of a large global and complex organization. Um, in that respect, uh, I, at the, my, at the time of joining my first board, I was 39, which I'm sure is very old for uh, people at the Oxford University, but it was very young for the average age of boards, which tends to be uh, in the 60s or 70s. Um, but also I'm black, I'm from Africa, and I'm a woman. Um, and so in many respects, I was an outlier joining um, corporate boards. Since I've joined corporate boards, it's now been over 10 years, I've had a CEO die, uh, chairman die um, while in office. Uh, I've had a company taken over um, by a competitor. Um, I've had a company be really challenged because of expropriation. So the threat of a government of taking over assets, regulatory fines, a complete shift in the ESG, but investor landscape um, in just this 10 years, activists in the stock, a whole multitude of changes um, that have occurred. What this tells me is that going forward, in order for companies to be competitive, we're going to need many more people at the table who don't necessarily come from a cookie cutter background. We need people who understand those global shifts in digitization, the global shifts in geopolitics that are materially changing the way in which we live and work um, on a daily basis. I completely agree. And last week you wrote an article in Bloomberg about the ethical questions that need to be asked when hiring CEOs. Uh, could you tell us more about the, what you think the role of ethics ought to play in hiring decisions? So to place this into context, there are three key responsibilities of a board. The boards are responsible for the oversight of the strategy. So what exactly is the company planning to, to sell? How are they going to do that? Where are they going to do it? The second issue is hiring and in some instances having to fire the CEO of the company. The third area is that boards provide oversight in what I call the cultural frontier. These are cultural issues. Some of them are sort of 
uh, not really surprising things like excellence and professionalism. Others of them are much more complex, things like worker advocacy issues, pay equity, gender issues, um, as well as uh, gender and racial uh, discrimination, as well as climate change, which I would say fall into that ESG bucket. Um, if, coming back to your specific question, the, the role of hiring a CEO has incredible importance, um, not only in terms of the day-to-day -day operations of the company, but also in, in imbuing a cultural uh, sort of norm to how the company views itself and how the corporation and its employees think about the corporate purpose of the organization. Traditionally, um, and I've been fortunate enough to be involved in the hiring, as I said, but also firing of many CEOs, um, the process of hiring a CEO has tended to be very prosaic. We've been, we've tended to focus on financial performance. Did this person generate revenues, generate profit? Did this person know how to manage strategically? Um, did this person know how to deal with operational efficiencies or inefficiencies? Um, what kind of a person is this in terms of leadership style? Are they more of a wartime CEO or a peacetime CEO? Uh, how do they deal with challenge? But we haven't traditionally focused on the question of ethics. Um, and by that, I mean the moral compass that might guide somebody in terms of their decision making. And this is, of course, an important piece, um, given that in just 18 months uh, uh, in the United States, there were 400 CEOs uh, and other people in senior executive positions that lost their jobs uh, related to Me Too, um, but also questions around uh, racial discrimination and areas that have traditionally fallen outside of the way we vet for CEO. Uh, the CEO has become, uh, become much more important as we try to gauge what kind of people um, should be leading these organizations in the 21st century. And that's why the ethical questions and really exercising our muscles as we think about how do we ask beyond getting references, how do we evaluate a person's moral compass and their ethics um, to me is going to continue to be a big and important piece. I completely agree. Um, we've seen a lot of scandals recently among the boards of companies, like you said. Do, do you think that's something that can be remedied through legal and policy change? Or do you think that we just need to go deeper into the inherent cultures of these co corporations? Well, Molly, I think it's important to put this in context. Every single day, without fail, billions of goods and services are delivered without incident, whether it's an Ikea box that you're putting a bookshelf together, whether you're buying a ticket to get on an airplane to go visit somebody somewhere far away, um, whether it's a hotel room, a car that doesn't break down, the food that you eat, this is delivered every single day. Your mobile phone, you pick it up, you don't even think twice about it working, you know it's going to work. All these aspects are functioning at the highest level in a global economy because boards and the corporations that they oversee are running and they're running well. Of course, every now and then, if you really think about the scale of what is going on, it is even perhaps surprising that we have so few incidents of, uh, of, uh, of failure. Okay, well, you, so you recently suggested that we're seeing a move away from globalization as well, um, including countries implementing more protectionist measures that limit capital flows and growing hostility to immigration. What are you, the main problems that you think this could pose? So there's no doubt in my mind that uh, through, through theoretical analysis or through theoretical uh, uh, modeling, uh, as well as practical historical evidence um, in everything from the Gilded Age from 1870 to 1900 in the United States to more recently, the period of 1950 to 2008, there is no doubt in my mind that in periods of more globalization, the global economy expands faster in terms of that GDP pie and the world is able to faster move hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. That's what the evidence tells us in practice, what we've seen. Um, but that's also what is clear from textbooks uh, in economic uh, canonical models. It is also clear that uh, we are now in a period of deglobalization. And by deglobalization, let me outline very quickly the five key pillars of globalization that I'm referring to. 
One is the trade in goods and services. So moving goods and services across borders, that is under threat. And in fact, according to the World Trade Organization, the growth in, in, uh, in trade has actually flatlined uh, to about 3% even before COVID hit. The second issue is capital flows, the ability for money to flow from places of low interest rates such as London and New York to be invested in higher interest rate uh, risk adjusted environments like Brazil or South Africa, that is also under threat um, given uh, the balkanized or the, dis the siloed world that we're living in more and more. The third area is immigration. Uh, we know that immigration and anti-immigration sentiment helped fuel Brexit, but more generally was really the backbone of the President Trump's uh, uh, agenda. And beyond that, around the world, there's definitely a mood music that looks much more against uh, uh, immigration. Perhaps worth underscoring this point is that according to the International Rescue Committee, there are now roughly 70 million people who are considered refugees or displaced. This is the highest number on record since we started collecting information. The fourth issue um, that pertains to globalization is this idea of global standards. Um, and that is also under threat in particular in my writings, both in my book, Edge of Chaos, which came out in 2018, and the book that will be published next week um, uh, called uh, How Boards Work, the issue that we see is that there's a splinter net emerging. This is a real risk that there will be two competing platforms um, of, of technology, one that will be China led uh, as opposed to another, which will be more US and Western led. Um, that is actually moving away from this idea of global standards. And the third issue, which has been underscored in what has happened with COVID, not only with addressing the initial uh, uh, arrival of COVID, but also just how we've dealt with the rollout of vaccines, it's perfectly clear that we're no longer in a coordinated world, um, which had been buttressed by Bretton Woods institutions such as the IMF and World Bank. Those multilateral institutions are now facing challenge and competition from organizations such as those in China, um, everything from RCEP to uh, Belt and Road, Road Initiative um, are basically suggesting that there are alternatives um, to the, uh, the multilateral global model that we're seeing. So where we're netting out here is that we're moving, it seems, the global seems to be moving more and more um, into a world of deglobalization, um, which can come with it, as evidence shows, um, a contraction in a global performance, and I would argue um, could have really damning consequences for human progress longer term. I'm fascinated by what you said about the splinter net. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you was what role you thought technology could play in, in solving these problems of globalization. But do you think that it will cause ultimately more harm than good? Well, I think, I hope that we can come up with a constructive um, narrative about why it is um, we should be working together. Uh, you know, if, if anything, COVID should have underscored this point that we aren't an island and this whole idea of every nation for itself um, doesn't work longer term. Um, I have a lot of faith in technology. When I think about investments and portfolios, I think about China being a key piece of the future story. I, I think it's, it is pretty clear that China, um, not only uh, because it, it, today it is the largest lender, trading partner, and, um, and also foreign direct investor in both developed and developing countries, but also just the sheer size of China um, as a juggernaut suggests that that's a place that you would want to invest and bet on uh, longer term. But I think the another two areas that I think are going to be important are, te are technology, um, specifically technology that invests in public goods like education and healthcare. We have seen what technology can do for consumerism as well as for social networks like Facebook, but we have not yet seen the full throttle effect of what technology could do for public goods um, such as education and healthcare. Um, so that's another area. And then of course, a third area that I'm very keen to bet into uh, is uh, energy transition. Um, in the advent of climate change, and we are looking for lots of innovation um, to come that will help address the concerns, not just in terms of risk mitigation on the downside, things like CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases, but really thinking about investing um, to the upside um, so that we can continue 
to improve people's living standards all around the world. In that respect, technology is hugely important. Um, I do worry that these type of split, the idea of a split internet could actually set us back if we're not living in a sort of globally coordinated world. Um, at the same time, we know that China is now leading the West in areas such as face recognition, quantum computing, other parts of AI. Um, and so I, you know, I hope and I'm optimistic that we will all see that these are global public goods and won't be focused only um, on, uh, on the short term. I'd like to come back to China in a minute, but first, how do you think corporations specifically um, can help solve these problems of globalization? What role do you think they play? It's a wonderful question because even before ESG became a thing and sort of in vogue in the last 10 years, and I, I, I may have mentioned, you know, we're talking about $45 trillion of money that is flowing towards this idea, idea of ESG. Corporations were already involved in society in a meaningful way. They create jobs. They generate revenues that gets taxed and becomes tax revenue for government. They actually invest in infrastructure and they are absolutely leading the charge um, when you think about things like innovation and R&D going forward. Um, you may have seen that President Biden in the United States just deliver, recently delivered a speech to Congress and it was astonishing that the United States investment in GDP uh, from uh, into sciences and R&Ds is less than 1% of US GDP. Traditionally, the US government has been a big player at not only creating the regulatory environment to support corporations, but also has been a big player in terms of being a visionary and proactively driving for innovation. Things like the Manhattan Project, things like um, Silicon Valley, DARPA, these are all the backbone of the success that we've seen um, many, many time, you know, times and time again um, when, it's, when in these type of innovations are led or encouraged by government. So corporations do play a critical role in terms of solving and addressing these constraints that could emerge from deglobalization. Um, we've seen, I happen to be on the board of a company that makes the masks uh, we saw what Defense Protection Acts, the DPAs that President Trump put in place, and some of the challenges of supply chains are commonly known. Um, corporations have had to deal with those uh, sort of uncertainties and risks that emerged around COVID and still deliver quality products uh, to consumers on a daily basis. So to my mind, they are hugely important in terms of uh, driving uh, the world forward, even in a period of deglobalization. They have in the past and they will going forward. Um, and we need to extract the best value from corporations, particularly in the areas of innovation, um, given the challenges, that suite of confluence of factors that we're dealing with um, in the world going forward. So let's talk about China. Um, many economists have pointed to China as, as an economy that's going to completely change the way that we think about economic growth and the way that we uh, view the global economy. What are your predictions for the role that China will play in the, in the coming years? I think uh, China is critically important. It's going to continue to be critically important. Um, if you go back in history, Angus Madison um, put some wonderful data together showing that in the 1700s, China was the largest and most important economy in the world. Um, they squandered from bad policymaking uh, 300 years. Um, and then really the turning point in, in their mind, um, as I spend a lot of time in China, um, is, is 1949 when the People's Republic of China really changed their approach and have since then have been um, a, you know, a rip roaring success in many aspects in terms of economic growth, in terms of moving hundreds of people out of poverty, the number of students that are graduating in engineering, um, the, the, move, the ability to even more recently to set very aggressive targets in terms of environment, um, which they are going after in terms of net zero in a very aggressive fashion. Um, I am not at all saying that China is pure and doesn't have any issues. No society is. Um, of course, the human rights record is something that keeps um, rearing its head. Um, but, you know, as I said, other countries have the same issues, uh, whether it's Stephen Lawrence in Britain or George Floyd, as we saw in the United States. Um, we have to be a bit more open minded in how com companies um, are navigating these challenging times. But that being said, 
it is absolutely my view that China is not going anywhere. As I mentioned earlier, China today is the largest foreign direct investor, largest trading partner, as well as the largest um, uh, lender in terms of debt. In fact, it's now larger than the Paris Club. It's larger than the IMF and World Bank um, as a lender. And it is the largest foreign lender to the United States government. Um, China is everywhere. And I think they will continue to be there being very deliberate and thoughtful about how they think about these very big areas that are going to define success or failure in the future, such as technology um, and such as, uh, such as the environment. So that's my view uh, regarding China. A lot of people are worried about the role that they'll play. What would your response be to them? Well, it depends really on, uh, on what specifically they're worried about. So, I mean, China, uh, uh, people have been worried about the West's uh, approach and, and intervention um, in, in the world. I think that we need to go back to brass tacks and, and really have a debate about what it is these countries are purporting to, to sell or purporting to support. Um, when I spend time in China, there's a lot of things that people look at it, uh, to the West and they don't find particularly admirable. They don't like that income inequality is so wide in the United States or across Europe. They don't necessarily like that the financial crisis, the biggest crisis before COVID to hit the world came from the West, they, you know, from, from uh, profligate uh, lending. Uh, they don't like the fact that populism, which is very destabilizing from a political perspective, has also been something that has been very characteristic of the West and not of China. Um, so it's very easy for us to uh, to take a normative approach and maybe point fingers uh, at, at, uh, at China and say, give them a long list of the things that they are underperforming on. But we clearly are not performing at the highest levels, even in the West. I mean, in the United States, infrastructure is graded D plus by the Association of, uh, of Civil Engineers. Um, you know, look at the OECD numbers in terms of performance of education at the PISA statistics. Um, in mathematics, in science, and reading, we've seen a material uh, downgrade of uh, education and students in the United States and uh, and Europe um, over several decades. And you know, more fundamentally, this group of this this generation of Americans, for the first time in the history of the country, will be less educated than the preceding generation. Um, so it's very easy to sit here and criticize China. Um, personally, I wouldn't worry too much about China at this stage. I would worry much more about things that we can influence in a material way that we're not influencing. Things like education, um, things like infrastructure. Uh, you know, we, unless we're able, people like myself and others who live in Western society, unless we're able to show that this model of politics and economics is something to aspire to, of course China is going to be something to worry about because their narrative, their story of economic growth, amazing infrastructure, real clear environmental plans and targets that they're delivering on, their you know, um, ability to be at the front foot front of, uh, uh, of technology are things that people want and people would admire. And, um, and it, it's our job to remind people and to create a narrative that is appealing to those people who um, want to see something uh, better emerge from the, from the West than what we've seen in the last several decades. Speaking of infrastructure and education, it seems like the perfect place to segue into uh, COVID. It wouldn't be a 2021 uh, interview without the C word. What do you think the future of our global economy looks like now post COVID? So with respect to where do we go from here, I think there are a couple of things that we need to appreciate. First of all, we need to make a delineation between a rebound and a recovery. A rebound is essentially what we're seeing now, and I think we will continue to see for 2021, which is that clearly we were all at home for 18 months. We were shut in for aggregate demand was, uh, was, was, was down uh, considerably uh, as we were quarantined. Um, and now we're all coming back post vaccination that obviously is going to be a boost in terms of economic uh, success and we're seeing it in terms of stock market highs hitting new highs almost every day and the forecasts for economic growth which remain to point upward for 2021. However, the second point that we need to be very attuned to is that there are a whole lot of structural problems which I alluded to earlier that were already 
creating a drag on the economy before COVID hit in earnest in 2020. So in my book, Edge of Chaos in 2018, I was already worried about technology and what that would mean for a jobless underclass. We were already worried about demographic shifts around the world. The fact that we have the quality and the quantity of the workforce depleting uh, in a rapid clip. We were already worried about inequality, inequality in income, inequality in healthcare and inequality in education. We were already talking about the decline in the growth rate um, before 2020 happened, um, when we were deep concerns about the weakness in public policy, the impotence both in monetary and fiscal policy. On the monetary side, we were already in a negative interest rate environment. On the fiscal side, we were deeply worried, um, even look at the Congressional Budget Office forecasts around the US, already worried um, in 2016 about the amount of debt that these countries were carrying, both at the government level, but also at the household level. That picture has not really materially changed. And if anything, COVID is accelerating these challenges um, uh, going forward and, and bringing us to a much more challenged situation earlier than we would hope. The last point I'll just make to, this, to your question is that although things are looking up um, in some places around the world, um, such as the UK and the United States, there are still large pockets of the world that remain in quarantine and remain um, in shortage from vaccines. I mean, look at what is happening in India as we record this. But beyond that, um, places like India are not expected to reach herd immunity before 2023. That's another 18, two, almost two years from now before they can think of hitting herd immunity. So, you know, do I, am I fundamentally optimistic? I, I'm not, I'm worried about a progressive uh, policies that are going to emerge. The fact that we've had to be uh, aggressive in terms of the stimulus and all the things that we did to keep the economy afloat. But at the same time, we need structural solutions to structural problems. Um, throwing money at the problem is not good enough. And, uh, you know, I do remain positive that we can come to the table with solutions. Um, but at the same time, I would just caution uh, that we shouldn't be too excited about uh, what seems or may what may seem to be uh, an uptick in our little narrow communities when the global economy in its entirety still has some way to go before we reach a global herd immunity. Um, you did recently suggest that um, America and Europe should provide some direct cash transfers to Africa to alleviate the COVID crisis. Do you think this approach would help strengthen um, developing economies in the long term? Well, I, as you may be aware, my first book um, about uh, 12 years ago now was uh, entitled Dead Aid, was a critique of aid programs um, not just to Africa, but really around the world. Um, these are programs, I'm not talking about NGOs giving money, uh, those are small beer, and I'm not talking about emergency aid. Um, I, I was talking about systemic aid, large amounts of money going to African governments by uh, multilateral institutions such as the IMF and World Bank, but also from large donors. Um, the truth is, we, that article that you're referring to, which I published in The Economist magazine last July, was really targeting the fact that we are in an emergency situation. Um, and COVID was, is an emergency situation, both in terms of the healthcare aspect of it, as well as the political uh, and economic, geopolitical and economic uh, environment and fallout that comes from this. So my proposal was really to say, we really ought to not only address this emergency by providing aid, but critically, I was suggesting that we have an opportunity to do something that could enhance and do better than traditional aid, which has tended to flow to governments, uh, which can sometimes be corrupt and not really use uh, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, proceeds in a way that is, uh, in fact, they use the proceeds in, the, in ways that are inimical to uh, society as opposed to benefiting society. So that is something that I think uh, we, we should be open to, um, you know, with, with, with many things around the world and with life, um, there's no right or wrong answer in some respect, um, but I tend to be someone who focuses on the data and the evidence and the data is, is in and it's pretty damning um, that traditional ways of delivering aid are, are just not good enough um, if we want to have long-term sustained growth. Um, however, 
we were in an emergency situation. And in that respect, uh, I feel like that should be on the table for debate. Well, you suggested that this would also offer an opportunity for the West to reassert its relevance on the continent, um, which has ceded to other um, powers like China. Do you think that would be a positive thing for the West or for Africa at all? Well, I think it's always a positive thing for third parties uh, like Africa. I mean, I, I would argue even for a woman, it's nice to have uh, more than one suitor. Um, and so in that respect, I think it's good for Africa to have more than one suitor. I think we gave uh, a good 50 years to the West uh, and the model of aid. And unfortunately that didn't deliver in terms of sustained long-term economic growth. We can sit here and quibble about how uh, some girls went to school or there were some hospitals built, but that's not sustained uh, economic growth. Um, that's a Band-Aid solutions. Um, and I, I do believe we can put a man on the moon. I think we can do better in terms of meaningfully upgrading people's uh, living standards. Um, but at the same time, I, I do also think that there is scope um, for new ideas, uh, re refreshed thinking um, in, in places like Africa um, to, uh, you know, at a time when the West has is, uh, got its own economic challenges. Um, it just seems to me crazy that the United States government would be borrowing money from China to then pass it along to Africa in the form of aid. Um, there obviously are dire needs in many places around the world and we are a global community so we should act and we should get involved. But my point is that we should do it in a way that is sustainable and that has the credibility around uh, generating long-term value and long-term sustainability for human progress. So, in a nutshell, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, I think, you know, I've always ascribed to Western values. I'm a big supporter of globalization. I'm a big supporter of market capitalism. Huge supporter of liberal democracy. But all of these values have been only in uh, inputted in uh, society for 1% of human history, 1% have we had liberal democracy and market capitalism. So we have a huge opportunity uh, and if not also an enormous risk um, that we don't succeed if we don't double down on delivering uh, a narrative but also executing um, at high levels to improve people's livelihoods around the world. Thanks. Um, I'm keen to move on to audience questions soon. Do submit questions if you have any. Um, so just one more one more topic from me. Um, given the increasing distrust in governments and in international corporations, what role do you see decentralized payment systems such as Bitcoin playing in shaping the world economy? So people are always skeptics of uh, new innovations. I mean, let's just get it out there. <laughs> and especially older generations, people who uh, are living with uh, with systems that work perfectly well and perhaps don't quite understand uh, what the big hoo-ha is um, for uh, new incarnations of what seems to already be getting done. Um, I am of a generation where we've always been taught that money is three things. It has to be something that's a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. Um, in that respect, uh, we've had fiat money, uh, which has emerged. This is uh, obviously the dollar, the pound. Um, these type of currencies are based on fiat. Uh, they have their risks. Uh, money can be printed in the form of seniorage that creates inflation. Um, and so in that respect, um, it does create some skepticism, if not uh, sort of concern about how the government uh, behaves uh, uh, over time. Um, just to put this in context, there's a wonderful book um, by Ken Rogoff and uh, Carmen Reinhardt called This Time It's Different. They looked at 900 years, 900 years of government behavior, and they conclude, uh, in fact, they show that governments uh, very often default um, on, uh, on debt, um, but also the amount of debt that governments hold, especially if it's over uh, or, or generate over 60% uh, debt to GDP, can create a material drag on economic success uh, in a way that is not good. So it's these type of arguments that have led people to innovate and to go to uh, Bitcoin. I mean, for old timers like myself, Bitcoin is very much like the gold bugs, um, you know, believing in that argument of scarcity. There's a finite a number of uh, Bitcoins that can be created and uh, you're able now to transact. You can buy a Tesla, you can uh, do a number of things um, by using Bitcoin. Um, so in conclusion, here's, here's what I, where I would land. It, it doesn't matter whether or not I believe that Bitcoin is of any value. Um, the more that there's a critical mass out there that believes that it is of some value, 
the more the value of Bitcoin will go up. Um, with respect to crypto in general, we know that even fiat currencies like the Chinese renminbi, the US dollar, they're already looking at cryptocurrencies, crypto dollar, crypto renminbi. Um, what I argued in a, a, a piece in the Financial Times recently was that even if you don't believe in it as a player in a market, as a corporation, you may still want to have some Bitcoin on your balance sheet because otherwise, by by not uh, you know never mind being uh, you know accused of being a luddite, um, but by not putting putting Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies on your balance sheet, you run the risk that one of your other competitors in the same sector is putting Bitcoin on your balance sheet, which could appreciate and therefore put them, your competitor, in a much better position to take you over. So this is about pragmatism. It's not about ideology or theory. Um, it's about actually what could happen. And as board members, we are required to think about risk mitigation um, as well as upside and thinking about growing corporations. And so the argument I was making is that we have to at least be open-minded to have that debate about whether or not we should have crypto on the balance sheet. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move to the audience questions. Peter from Mansfield says, thank you for your interesting talk. On the subject of Africa, what do you think is the single best thing that individuals in the West can do to help everyday Africans? Well, I think that uh, that question is kind of, it's, it's twofold. Um, in one respect, um, I think that it, it, we need to erase the sense of us and them. I think there's very much embedded in how people think about Africa, engage with Africa. It's very much, oh, you know, woe is me. What can I do to help the people? You know, isn't it so sad over there? And I don't think that that kind of framing or thinking has been constructive or helpful in terms of investing and driving longer term success. There, in, in my book, Dead Aid, I give numerous examples of what we could be doing better. We could trade, we can invest. Um, even at the micro level, uh, areas such as Kiva, uh, microfinancing are, are much lower uh, and, uh, you know, uh, volume, lower uh, price point ways of intervening and getting involved in investment um, uh, across Africa. So um, in other words, I would say call your MPs um, to, uh, to really drive uh, home. We need more investment. Um, but at the same time, at a micro level, get on, on the internet, go to Kiva um, as one example of a, a fantastic platform, but there are other platforms and, and look around and see where you can support investment, um, but also recognizing that you know, I have no objection to emergency aid or the need to plug in gaps um, when uh, trauma hits such as COVID. Um, but at the same time, the status quo 60 years on, I mean, again, many students are, are probably too young to know, but when you've been uh, around as long as I have, uh, you will appreciate that it does seem a bit insane that we keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result, uh, especially when we know what generates economic growth um, more generally across the world. Well, speaking of dead aid, Letty from St. Hughes asks, um, why do you think your book had such an enduring and significant impact? And do you think that politicians and policymakers have taken those lessons on board? And if not, why not? Oh, I do think they've taken it on board. Um, I've been told by many people that uh, dead aid has become a noun. So sometimes people say, well, that's, that, that's just dead aid uh, in, in meetings uh, that I even have not uh, been privy to. I've not been in those meetings. And so, yeah, I think there was a message there that people found refreshing. Um, I wasn't saying abandon Africa, ignore Africa. Uh, you know, I was saying we can do better. And I, I can't imagine um, people aren't attracted to uh, the idea or the notion of doing better um, and enhancing uh, you know, people's lifestyles. So um, I think that, uh, that that really resonated with people at that time. They were very keen to, to see uh, change, not just with aid to Africa, but more generally around um, capitalism. Obviously, if you recall, my book came out uh, 2009. It was around the financial crisis period. People were tired of the status quo. We want to see better. We want to do better. And I think that. Uh, aid to Africa was just one of those things for decades. Decades have come and gone. Um, countries like South Korea, Singapore, China were poorer than African countries in the 1950s, now are richer than even Western countries. You know, what is going on? And somehow Africa seemed to be peeling off and getting worse. So we really, it was to motivate discussion, motivate change. Uh, as I like to say, we can put a man on the moon. Uh, I think we can actually solve poverty in Africa. 
Well, from from your, your 2009 book, Dead Aid, to the book that's coming out next week, um, Daniel Paul uh, from Balliol asks, how can investors negotiate relationships with erratic CEOs like Elon Musk, who bring great value to a brand but put the company at risk? Well, I, I've talked a little bit about the levers that companies have or boards have in terms of managing the organization. They can obviously pick the CEO, um, but at the same time, um, they influence change through compensation, how we pay them, how we how we think about um, compensating uh, CEOs more generally. Um, you know, it's interesting that uh, you know, someone like Elon Musk has, has really staked an enormous claim. He is using his money. He started off with his money, his investment, and you know, time and time again, I think he's now CEO of around five companies, the Boring Company, uh, SpaceX, uh, Tesla, I think a couple more in there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he is, uh, he's our modern day, uh, you know, innovator. Uh, and, and I think that should be celebrated rather than um, curbed. Uh, and I, I think that if anything, globally, we're missing out on people being more uh, engaged much more about uh, thinking much more about how we might be able to solve problems by thinking innovatively, innovatively and not sort of stuck in, in a, a box um, to try and deliver uh, on these things. I actually am very attracted to, to that proposition, recognizing that there, there, he has a board, of course he does, and that board obviously has guardrails to ensure that uh, he doesn't overstep that. And, uh, you know, I, I would just uh, encourage uh, you know, not just private sector, but also the government to be much more innovative, much more data driven, much more focused on on, on longer term outcomes. Um, and, and in that respect, that that is what drives society. It's the Wright brothers who decided to build a plane. Um, it's it's the you know uh, Fleming uh, with penicillin. I mean, these are the people who drive society. Um, and I think the worst thing that we can do is to curb them in a way that actually puts society uh, at a great disadvantage. Again, this doesn't mean that we, they don't have guardrails um, to make sure that uh, they don't create systemic risks or cause a uh, value loss in an egregious way. Um, but uh, you know, it's precisely um, my concern today is that we're living in a world where people are becoming less innovative, less interesting in terms of the ideas they come up with, very deconstructive. Everybody has a, a reason to tear up uh, everything that we've done in society because we're, you know, ascribed or described as, as uh, uh, you know, supporting climate change or being racist or, you know, take your pick. But nobody really is coming forward with real innovative solutions that can change the world. And it's that mindset that uh, somebody like Elon Musk, I think, should be nurtured and encouraged. Um, Rachel asks, in global m and um, and A, how can we assess company culture and price it into the valuation, both positively and negatively, more pressingly? As students, how can we seek out organizations with healthy cultures? Oh, we're doing that much more now. Um, read the annual reports. That's the best solution, uh, I would say. Um, you know, if you don't feel comfortable reading what companies are saying they're doing, rating agencies do that. Analysts reports from, from the different banks that uh, review companies um, do that type of analysis. Sustain uh, Analytics is an example of a company that's sp specifically focused on, on, on ESG and, uh, and on these areas. Um, the M&A question is an interesting one because of course, as we, we, as we are uh, involved in buying and selling companies, that is another area aside from taxes, aside from synergies, what else um, can we look at? And, and we are, uh, if you look at some of the metrics, there's a lot more work being done on metrics to start to really parcel out and think specifically about the metrics that are associated with uh, with ethics. So, um, you know, I would encourage you, I'm very sanguine about this area. Uh, it, it's uh, it's ripe. Um, there's a lot of work being done uh, amid, uh, amid uh, ESG, but uh, specifically with respect to embedding these types of uh, uh, pieces of work in, in uh, how people view companies. And as I said, there's a lot of ways that you can actually uh, road test companies and see how that they're, they're performing in these areas. We have an anonymous question, which is what tips do you have for young, diverse candidates trying to navigate entrance into corporate boards as penetra penetration rates for these groups is currently quite low? Well, it's low, but it's certainly better than it was. When I joined my first board uh, just over 10 years ago, I was the only black person and the only woman uh, in the boardroom uh, very often. I mean, that has changed. And I think by and large, is the, would be seen as, as bizarre, uh, if not unacceptable. Um, 
So my advice is very simple, and it's actually true, not just for people who look like me, but also for people who uh, don't look like me. You have to be uh, a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. It's like, and by that, I mean, build your craft, focus on building a reputation and real deep skill and knowledge um, so that you become the go-to person in particular areas. Um, I'm very fortunate that my career has basically coincided with an era of people being interested in the global economy, the emerging markets, and broader issues around risk. Um, and that's why I ended up on a board. But very often, I think that young people um, are in a rush. Um, they don't really invest in time to build a skill um, that they can be known for or that separates them from um, the pack of very talented young people. And so my advice is, um, is that invest in your, in your education in a very broad way, read widely, read competing views, don't just read to, to respond, read to absorb arguments and understand because ultimately in the boardroom, what matters is judgment. It's not about having a right answer, it's about good judgment, making the best decisions with the information that you have today. And then the final point I would just make is no doesn't mean never, it just means not now. Um, I have been rejected from many things. I continue to get rejected from a lot of things that I would like to do. It's gonna happen to you too. And it doesn't mean that the person who's rejecting you for a job or an opportunity is racist or sexist or hates you know, people from a certain country. Uh, it, it, what, you, what I would do is I'd suggest that you spend your time really courting to those people to get in more information as to what it is that you can do better um, and how you can improve your odds of being considered for those particular roles. So um, I think those are the things that have really helped me in, uh, in my success. I know that we live in a world where uh, when people don't get things, they immediately start to look for reasons. Uh, oh, it must be because I'm black. It must be because I'm a woman. Um, and I, I would argue, um, certainly a lot of my friends who look like me, who are incredibly successful, um, have got there by not assuming that that's the reason at every turn. Um, and more generally, as I said, be a continuous learner. Just because you graduate from Oxford, um, you know, you're not going to get an engraved invitation. Uh, you know, ultimately, that's just a, that's a, a necessity, but it's not a, a sufficient. Um, and the world has become hyper competitive. You've got to continue to invest in yourself. That's what people are interested in. They're interested in people with good judgment, new ideas, fresh ideas that are constructive and not just trying to tear everything down. Dr. Moyo, thank you so much. It's really been an honor to host you today. And I hope that we'll be able to have you in person someday soon when things are back to normal. I'll finish with a question that we're asking all of our speakers this term. If there was one thing, if you take all of your expertise and knowledge and the things that you've learned, um, bottle it and leave our members with one thing to take away, what would that be? Be positive. The world is not coming to an end in your generation. Uh, the world has gone through much tougher times and the world will continue. And so be a positive force, a force for good, a force for constructive progress, not a force for deconstruction and negativity. Um, couch your answers, your contributions to society in a positive, energized, uh, enthusiastic and innovative way. Um, that is the best piece of advice uh, I can give you. Nobody likes a naysayer, nobody. Um, so walking around with a whole list of what's wrong without talking about how we can improve in a very constructive, scalable, positive way is of no use to anyone. Um, and nobody really wants to spend time with a naysayer. So my piece of advice is be positive. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.